Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. The structure of this event will first be introductions, then a program with Ralph Blumenthal, and lastly, we'll have some time to take questions and comments. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to type in your concern in the chat box and we can assist you there. To ask a question or make a comment, um, you may raise your hand um, to be unmuted or type it in the chat or Q&A box and we will address those at the appropriate time. The Believer is the weird and chilling true story of Dr. John Mack. This eminent Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winning biographer risked his career to investigate the phenomenon of human encounters with aliens and to give credibility to the stupefying tales shared by people who were utterly convinced they had happened. Nothing in Mack's four decades of psychiatry had prepared him for the otherworldly accounts of a cross-section of humanity, including young children who reported being taken against their wills by alien beings. Over the course of his career, his interest in alien abduction grew from curiosity to wonder, ultimately developing into a limitless, unwavering passion. Based on exclusive access to Mack's archives, journals, and psychiatric notes and interviews with his family and closest associates, the Believer reveals the life and work of a man who explored the deepest of scientific conundrums and further leads us into the hidden dimensions and alternate realities that captivated Mac until the end of his life. Ralph Blumenthal was an award-winning reporter for the New York Times. He co-authored the Times article in 2017 that broke the news of a secret Pentagon unit investigating UFOs and is the author of four nonfiction books, including Miracle at Sing Sing, How One Man Transformed the Lives of America's Most Dangerous Prisoners. A distinguished lecturer at Baruch College, he lives in New York City. Please welcome Ralph Blumenthal. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> I really appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, I love uh, New Mexico, I love Santa Fe. When I was the Times correspondent in Texas, uh, New Mexico was part of my bailiwick, and I couldn't find enough opportunities um, to get away there to both vacation and uh, cover news stories, uh, go to the border, uh, et cetera. And my book is published by the University of New Mexico Press, I'm very happy to say. So let me start out with talking a little bit about John Mack. I'm going to read a brief excerpt, and then I'm happy to answer Jessica's questions and open it up afterwards to uh, all of you. And I really appreciate your uh, being here. As I said, uh, every author's dream is to talk to a literate audience um, about his or her book. So uh, John Mack uh, was a Harvard psychiatrist, um, very esteemed in his field, uh, who had won a Pulitzer Prize uh, with a biography of Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. Um, and through a series of circumstances that I outlined in my book, The Believer, uh, he became interested in this very uh, renegade field of UFOs and alien abduction. People who came to him with stories of encounters with alien beings, um, which was not the, the, the regular thing for, for Harvard psychiatrists to be sure. Um, and uh, he ended up convening uh, study groups of these people. He didn't know whether to call them patients, or he ended up with the term experiencers because it's kind of neutral, better than abductees, which assumes the reality of their uh, encounters. Um, and he studied them uh, at great length. He, he wrote a book, a first book called Abduction, which was 13 case studies in great detail. Uh, about these people, men, women, children, all ages, all professions who had these uh, inexplicable encounters with alien beings. Um, that got him into some trouble with Harvard, uh, as I outline in the book. Uh, Harvard was not happy with that at all. Um, and uh, in the end, he was exonerated of any wrongdoing um, and continued to uh, investigate. Uh, he was run over by a drunk driver in London at the age of almost 75 in 2004. And uh, I had just encountered one of his books uh, when I was a Times correspondent in Texas. And I thought I would interview him. I thought it was amazing that a Harvard psychiatrist was interested in aliens. 
And uh, before I could uh, pick up the phone to call him, I, I found in the paper that he was dead, run over. So that's when I reached out to the family and eventually got access to his uh, vast archives. He, he luckily uh, recorded everything and made records of everything, kept uh, wonderful notes, and I had access to all that for my book. Um, so I'm going to start off with reading a, an excerpt, just a couple of pages uh, from The Believer. Um, um, and uh, th this uh, encounter, this, this incident that I'm going to read about takes place in Brazil in, in 1994. Uh, he was about to publish his first book, um, and he was traveling all over the world to gather data uh, about these weird encounters for which no explanation has yet emerged. I mean, forget what the, skept the so-called skeptics say about mental illness or hallucinations or sleep apnea, uh, none of the explanations really explain what these people have, have experienced because some of them obviously happen during the day when they're not asleep and some happen to small children who are not influenced by uh, TV or movies or books uh, that they've read, they're too young. So um, it, it is a, a, an authentic mystery. So in 1994, uh, Mac and his companion um, went to Brazil to investigate the stories they'd heard there. And he is um, hypnotized by a um, therapist in Brazil. And he gives an insight that I found very revealing for how he got interested in the subject of alien abduction. So um, let me just uh, read that. Um, um, one evening, Mac took time away to be hypnotized by Gilda Mora. She was an um, abduction investigator in Brazil. He felt anxious, he told her. I feel fear right through my body. You are here. You are so safe, she said. Mac visualized a room with a table, a TV turning itself on and off, a child's nursery table. I'm sort of halfway there, he said. He was going down a hallway past the desk, with a tiny black haired receptionist. Then it's blocked, he said. Go on, Mora said. I could go into space, free, travel anywhere, Max said. I hear ringing in my ears now, high pitched. Don't try to make up a story, Mac, Mora said. Let it happen. He continues, like a ketamine trip I took once. He free associated. I'm in this blue space, but too small, like a planetarium space, temple walls. I'm floating, ancient. I'm I'm keeping it blocked up. He stopped. I'm afraid I'm stuck. There's something I'm supposed to do. I don't know what it is. I'm afraid I'm not doing this right. Mora counted. One, two, three. You can see, Mac. He was in an enclosure, very small, like an eggshell made of porcelain. Then he thought, I'm out in the desert. I don't know why it's so cold. It could be another planet. He felt so alone. There is nobody, no God. I'm scared to be alone. I'm terrified of aloneness. He had an image of characters from the Wizard of Oz tramping through the Judean wilderness. I feel lost there, lost in space, like a terror of death that for me, death won't be joined by joy of loved ones. Death will be utter aloneness in space. Suddenly, he perked up. I got an idea, he said. This is like an insight, why I'm interested in abductions. Can I say this or stay on the journey? You can say that, Mora answered, and then continue the journey. Because, Mac continued excitedly, the abduction story is a welcoming story because it means that, oh, I'm getting goose pimples as I think of this. I'm not alone. There is life in the universe. It may not be, you know, familiar traditional Christian life or Jewish life, but it's still some kind of life. The universe has beings in it. You know, maybe they're not nice to humans. They come, they do this and that, but there's some kind of population out there, you know, in this universe. Mora nudged him back to his journey. It's the fear of aloneness in this life. The fear of aloneness when I'm dying, he said. It's like my mother. It's like, where did she go when she died? It's funny, this whole thing. I see why I'm so interested in this abduction story because it's the opposite of my belief system. It's the welcome opposite to my conscious belief system because I was raised to believe in a universe with nothing in it. No God, no intelligence, no life, no nothing. So 
um, I found that very revealing because it, it helps explain, and it comes late in the book, uh, why this Harvard psychiatrist who was very well grounded in uh, earthly concerns. I, I should tell you also that he was very socially active. Uh, he protested nuclear weapons uh, in Arizona. He got arrested with his whole family. He started a, a psychiatric clinic for indigent people in, uh, in Cambridge and near Harvard. Um, so uh, he was very uh, concerned about social conditions uh, on earth. And then uh, suddenly through a series of uh, circumstances, synchronicities, you could say, um, that I, I outline in the book, um, he becomes interested in abduction. And what happened was, and I'll say this briefly, um, he, he went out to Esalen in California, you know, that think tank on the Pacific, where they were doing all kinds of strange things in the 60s. Um, uh, it's a hot bath resort that the Indians actually had started, the Native Americans. And um, he went out there and he got interested in a, a program of uh, what, what he called, or what they called holotropic breathing, regulated breathing that, um, uh, creates a kind of a drug-like experience without drugs. It can recall a, a previous life or um, put people in a kind of a trance. And that's what happened to him. Uh, he, he felt he was in, in Russia in the 1700s, 1600s, a peasant, and he was watching his son being decapitated by a Mongol warrior. And he relived the traumatic death of his mother from, from appendicitis when he was eight and a half months old, which was a very traumatic event in his life. So he had all these experiences and at, at Esalen, um, and this would have been in the, um, in the late eighties, uh, he met a woman who was actually, another fellow psychiatrist who was actually treating uh, or counseling people who had these experiences of encountering alien beings. And he thought it was nuts. <laughs> he thought it was crazy. But um, the, the woman uh, who interested him in the subject or didn't interest him in the subject told him there was a painter in New York named Bud Hopkins. And if he was ever in New York, he, he should look him up. And again, one of the many strange uh, synchronicities of the story, he was in New York um, in 1990. He, despite himself, he didn't know why he was doing it. He called Bud Hopkins. And Bud Hopkins showed him material on these people that Bud Hopkins uh, had, had interviewed. He, he was a painter, he wasn't a psychiatrist, but he was interested in the subject. And they had told him the most extraordinary experiences of encountering aliens. So uh, that's what got John Mack hooked. And he eventually collected a group of people, men and women to study himself. And, uh, and he was off and running. And so that's really the beginning of his, uh, and it's, it's kind of an obsession. Um, and I call him the believer, but um, it, it, in some ways it's a, um, a you know, unflattering description of somebody who's gullible, but I use it in another way. Um, he was a believer in social justice. He was a believer in breaking boundaries. He was a believer in trying new things and standing up to authority. And um, uh, so that's why I call my book, The Believer. So that's a you know quick cook's tour of the, of the territory, and um, I'm happy to respond to to questions and uh, explore some of these same same themes in in response to those questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, my first question is: Are you a believer? <laughs> Were you a believer before you began researching John Mack and abductees? Well, uh, Jessica, as I say, I said in a new piece for the New York Times, um, that's a question that has come up ever since I wrote that story in the New York Times, uh, exposing the Pentagon effort to investigate uh, UFOs. And I'm a little uncomfortable with that question because first of all, it's very personal. Secondly, uh, and more importantly, um, I think it's, in, it's, it's not a good question. Uh, and, um, um, others have said this before, that it assumes that uh, UFOs are something that you either believe in or don't believe in, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a spiritual thing like religion. 
Um, when in fact, as we now know from a report that the government put out last year, UFOs are physically real. In other words, there are things there that have been uh, identified and measured and, and tracked in the atmosphere that don't conform to anything we know on Earth. They're faster, they disappear, they make U-turns, they plunge sometimes into the ocean and out of the ocean. So um, uh, in a way, it's like saying, you know, do you believe in the moon? Do you believe in the stars? Do you believe in the ocean? Uh, it's there, it's real. Uh, we don't know what they are. We don't know where they come from. Uh, and I'm not talking about aliens now. That's a whole different. And the government has never studied aliens. They've just studied UFOs. But anyway, uh, so that's a quick answer that I give uh, to, uh, to believe that you don't have to be a believer to know that UFOs exist. Now, what, what they mean, I'm like everybody else. I don't know Are these what these alien encounters uh, that people have experienced, what they mean. I don't know. It's a genuine mystery. And we can explore that a little more. Thank you, I really appreciate that answer. Um, how did you first learn about Mac um, and what made you wanna write about a book about him, John? So as I said, I mean, I was in Texas uh, for the New York Times and I picked up a copy of, of his second book, Passport to the Cosmos. And um, you know, it may interest your audience of readers that um, author, many authors I know, including myself, um, don't uh, really uh, sort of intellectually choose their, their book topics uh, by sitting around, you know, thinking of a, a good book to write. The, the books kind of choose them. And uh, it's, it's kind of a mystical thing. And all the books I've done really have kind of dropped in my lap in one way or another um, in, in a strange way through, you know, what I called before synchronicities, which are these, you know, you call Jung, uh, the great, um, uh, you know, psychologist, psychiatrist, um, uh, co basically coined the term for things that connections that we don't understand. Uh, it's like you're, you know, you're traveling on a plane, and the pilot says, "If you look to your left, you see the Grand Canyon," and your book was just open to a passage about the Grand Canyon. Now, was that a coincidence or a synchronicity? So. I was in Texas for the New York Times. I picked up this book, Passport to the Cosmos, and, um, and I was hooked. I mean, I thought, you know, this was amazing that a Harvard psychiatrist would be so interested in aliens. And then, as I said, I, I found out he'd suddenly been run over in London, and that's what got me interested. And I spent 17 years going through his archives, thanks to his family, which made them available. And, um, and so that's how I did the book. I, I didn't start off, you know, my background at the New York Times was in uh, investigative reporting. I wrote about the mafia. I wrote about Nazi war criminals. I wrote about crooked public officials. So, you know, anything but um, UFOs and aliens, but that, that's how it started. Since you had not experienced any alien phenomenon or activity yourself, um, how did your research affect your life? Um, did it completely change the way you thought about the world? Did it disrupt your life in any way? It didn't change my life, really. It, it opened vistas to me because, uh, I mean, I was always kind of a spiritual person. I, I, I was brought up like John Mack in a German Jewish household. Um, by the way, I never saw a UFO or met an alien and neither did John Mack. Uh, to his disappointment, actually, uh, he was kind of hoping, but in a way later he thought uh, it was probably good because it left him purer uh, to, to research the subject. So he really didn't have any stake in, in the issue. Uh, he was a complete outsider, as was I. So um, it just, re you know, I'd always thought that there was more to the world than, you know, the four uh, physical dimensions that we see, you know, uh, the three dimensional space and time. Um, so I always thought that th th there was a lot of mysteries left in, in the universe, and this really confirmed it because I saw people like John Mack were intrigued uh, as well, and a lot of people uh, have invested time in, in this mystery. No one has solved it, but it really opened my, my eyes, my boundaries. Thank you. Um... Why did Mac risk his academic um, reputation by deciding to study people who claim to experience alien abductions? Why did he decide to take this research so seriously? 
That's that's a very good question. And um, uh, it was, you know, as I said, he started off very well grounded in earthly subjects. He was very socially conscious. He, he was very dedicated to helping people, you know, poor people was it with setting up clinics. He was very much against nuclear weapons. He was very um, involved in the peace process. He actually, um, after he wrote this book on, on Lawrence of Arabia, he was considered an expert on the Middle East. So he was invited to all kinds of conferences on peace in the Middle East. And this was a time, um, a very uh, fraught time in the Middle East when like today, there was a serious risk of conflict between the Palestinians and Israelis. Um, uh, Anwar Sadat had not yet made his trip uh, from Egypt to uh, Jerusalem. Um, so there was still a state of war between uh, you know, all the Arab countries and Israel, but he would go there and lecture and talk about the possibilities of peace. And he actually met with Yasser Arafat, which is a story I tell in the book, uh, he thought, again, maybe naively, and Mac was a bit naive, he thought that um, he could solve the problems of the Middle East if he just, you know, talked to the right people. So he met with Arafat, and Arafat wanted to reach out, particularly to American Jews, to uh, try to convince them that he was um, serious about making peace. Um, and, um, and Mac was interested in t taking on that that mission, but he, he was enough of a realist to, to, to realize in the end that uh, this was much too big an issue for him. He, he couldn't do it. And um, the, the um, enmities were much too serious for him to, um, to tackle. But um, uh, so he was sort of um, uh, drawn to lost causes, you could say. And, and he was very confident as a psychiatrist and as a Harvard professional, and almost too much so, some people thought. Um, he would just bull ahead, you know, before he had the whole story, you know, nailed down. Um, so um, he, uh, when he stumbled across uh, this issue from Bud Hopkins, and Bud Hopkins showed him the uh, the, the, the stories and Bud Hopkins had already written a number of books on abduction. He was a real pioneer. Uh, John Mack said, wow, you know, this is for me. I got to get to the bottom of this. And um, he, he was that kind of person. He wasn't intimidated. Uh, he didn't think, gee, this might not be good for my career. He just said, this is an authentic mystery, which it is. It absolutely is. Um, and, and don't believe all the stories that, you know, the so-called skeptics tell you about, you know, this is the answer, this is the answer. And nobody has the answer. Nobody understands what, what is going on. Um, uh, so Mac was naive enough and courageous enough to think that um, he could make a difference. So that's, that's what he did and wrote two books, um, you know, made a lot of appearances, uh, uh, wrote articles, um, so, uh, you know, combination of hubris, uh, he had a towering intellect. Um, he was very, very smart. Um, and he thought he could, um, you know, make a difference. Why did the Harvard administration uh, react so harshly to the publication of Mac's first book about alien abductions? And uh, what were their concerns about his clinical work and psychiatric research? Well, uh, you know, Harvard is a mainstream institution, and the uh, the, the uh, administration there was getting calls from alumni saying, you know, what is this guy doing? You know, he's because he was always identified as a Harvard psychiatrist. Whoever you know, he went on Oprah at one point, um, and he brought some of his experiences with him, and it, it's available on YouTube, by the way. You can Google it. <laughs> um, and um, by the way, TV is not a great medium for discussing these, um, uh, these complicated issues, including you know, the talk shows he went on in his zeal to uh, promulgate his, his research. So uh, that was probably a mistake because uh, the reality type shows he got on made, basically made fun of him and the people he brought on. And it, it's a very, very complicated issue as, as I hope you know, people who, who read the book and who listen to our talk will, will realize. 
Um, it's not a matter of ridicule, uh, although it often is held up to ridicule. Uh, it's just um, a profound mystery. So um, anyway, he, um, um, I, I forgot the thread of the question now. Uh, oh, Harvard. So uh, of course, uh, Harvard uh, being, you know, full of, uh, supported by benefactors and alumni, and they see these stories about John Mack of Harvard, you know, talking about aliens. Um, uh, they got scared and they formed a secret committee uh, to investigate him. Um, I call it an inquisition uh, because they use the, the, this panel used the term <laughs> and you can't tell a psychiatrist that this is not an inquisition <laughs> because the psychiatrist will, will always ask himself, uh, why are they using the term if it's not an inquisition? So um, it was an inquisition. It was a secret inquest into his beliefs, into his teaching methods, into his finances. Was he making kind of money off this? And he wasn't really because um, he was taking some insurance for a while. He got paid for his book, but uh, that money went pretty quick. I mean, uh, it wasn't a fortune. And um, but, it, but Harvard wanted to uh, see if there was something untoward going on here, you know, the bad publicity for Harvard. So they convened this, this committee and it was in secret uh, because they didn't want any publicity. And um, they called all these people, Harvard colleagues and some of the experiences themselves um, to testify. And um, um, they, it was very uncomfortable for John Mack. Um, what he did was he got two amazing lawyers. Um, one um, was uh, a lawyer who had um, investigated the priest abuse scandal in Boston. Um, and another was uh, a lawyer who had investigated the Iran-Contra arms scandal under uh, uh, President Reagan. Um, and, um, and these two lawyers really held Harvard's feet to the fire and they made Harvard come across with a lot of documents that it really didn't wanna reveal. But by the way, the, the story of the Harvard Inquisition has um, never been told before because it was secret and there was no report at the end, Harvard just said uh, to John Mack, um, okay, um, just be a little more circumspect, you know, don't be so enthusiastic, but you didn't do anything wrong. There were no charges, didn't strip him of his professorship or anything. Um, so there was really no record of what happened except the record of uh, reports that they sent John Mack, which I had access to in his archives. And I interviewed um, his lawyers and I, I got those records and, um, so I was able to piece together the story and it's all in the book. So, um, so that's why Harvard was uh, that, you know, they thought it was bad, bad publicity. And by the way, what I point out in the book is that Harvard was no stranger to, you know, to strange research. I mean, William James, the, uh, the great father of psychology was at Harvard a hundred years before. And he talked about seances and all kinds of strange things that he had been involved in. And, um, and so Harvard was not, you know, this ivory tower that never touched, um, you know, strange science. They dabbled in it all the time, but there was something about John Mack that set them off. And, um, uh, and I think they were very embarrassed by it in the end. Thank you. Um, this next question uh, has come up a couple of times in the chat and Q&A, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, what are some of the abduction cases that have stood out the most to you or the most intriguing stories of encounters? Well, uh, they are amazing. <laughs> uh, John Mack told 13 case studies, these stories in his first book. And he told others in his second book, which was a little more um, uh, distanced, you could say, a little more philosophical. Uh, for example, uh, in his first book, um, he seemed to give credence to the actual literal accounts. Um, and later he realized that um, it may not be happening in our reality. It must be, it might be another kind of reality that penetrates our reality in ways we don't understand. I mean, another dimension or whatever. But so uh, in the beginning, um, 
he thought uh, these stories had to be true because he found no other explanation. The people were not crazy. They were not looking for publicity. They were you know, afraid of publicity. Um, uh, some of the stories were told by little children uh, who were not, made, you know, not uh, uh, parroting TV scripts or movies or books they had read. Um, sometimes there were third party, in, in unusual cases, there were third party witnesses who saw people missing at certain times. The, the abductions were usually associated, not always, but often with a UFO sighting nearby. So people said, remembered later that they saw a UFO and then they saw these beings and then they were transported onto the ship and all these things happened. So, and these people were normal except for that. They were absolutely normal people. Uh, they had no history of, of trauma. They were normal in the sense that they had the usual trauma. Some were victims of sexual abuse. Some had you know, the, this trauma, that trauma, but that makes them normal. There was nothing that explained um, these accounts. So, um, so John Mack was left with uh, this, this puzzle, you know, you know, what accounted for, for this. Um, so, um, so you were asking about the story. So, uh, all the stories sort of followed a, a basic, um, uh, template, you could say. Um, and yet they were all extremely different in details, which was interesting. That was another thing that gave John Mack confidence that he was really onto something. So, you know, the general story, um, um, the core abduction story, as it's been called, was that people um, sometimes in their bedrooms at night, but sometimes in the middle of the day, driving a car or out in a field or wherever, would see a some kind of a craft. Um, they then were aware of beings. Uh, they were uh, immobilized in some way. They were taken aboard the, this craft. They recognized the interior. It had a certain smell. It was all white and um, strangely lit and, and, and rounded. And these beings that they described in various ways, small beings uh, with pointy chins and, and big heads, rubbery kind of uh, physiognomy, or taller figures that seemed to be in charge. There was a variety of of these beings would perform tests on these people. Sometimes they would remove eggs from, from women and sperm from men for some kind of reproductive procedure. Um, so that was the basic story, okay? And then, uh, but there were many, many variations. Uh, people were very particular on types of instruments they recognized and uh, actual conversations they carried on telepathically with these beings. So there was a, a great variety of experiences that they would relate. And it wasn't only under hypnosis. Some of, them, some of the experiences they remembered consciously um, but then they were the memories were kind of wiped somehow, and they uh, were uh, you know induced into kind of a trance. John Mack did not like hypnosis; it it was too unpredictable. He preferred relaxation techniques uh, to just relax the people, and then they remembered more. Um, so uh, the stories that people told. I mean, the most famous story was Betty and Barney Hill a couple in New Hampshire who were coming back from a belated honeymoon in 1961, although the story didn't really get aired till uh, four or five years later because they kept it to themselves, but they were coming back uh, from Niagara Falls and they noticed uh, something following them. Um, and uh, they looked through binoculars. It was some kind of a craft and they were overtaken with fear and the car stopped in the middle of the road. Um, and both of them, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, by the way, they were an interracial couple, which is interesting for the time. Uh, Barney was a, a postman who had served in World War I. He was black and Betty was a social worker. She was white. Um, and uh, which is one of the reasons they didn't want to tell the story right away because they were involved in civil rights work and they thought that, um, you know, as an interracial couple, they would be subject to even more scrutiny if they told the story. But anyway, they, they later recounted for another psychiatrist, not John Mack, because he wasn't involved yet. Uh, this was in the 60s, but a very prominent psychiatrist 
uh, Benjamin Simon, who had uh, studied World War II veterans and post-traumatic stress, uh, he was their psychiatrist and he um, adduced from them the story about how they were both taken to a craft and, and subject to medical procedures not sexual procedures, reproductive, but other things. Betty's dress was actually torn in the process, she said. And then they were returned to their car. And so that's the, the basic story. There was a whole book about it. Um, and, um, and then there were uh, other you know, famous stories. Um, um, probably the other most famous story is the sightings at a children's school in um, uh, Harare, uh, Zimbabwe, former Rhodesia, um, in around 1994. Um, uh, school children at recess, um, a mixed group of children, about 60 children at recess, black, white, uh, all around you know, 11, 12 years old, saw or, or re recounted later seeing a craft landing, two small beings, get out, the, the beings communicated with them telepathically that they were kind of lost, that they should take, that the, the children should take better care of the earth. Um, and um, uh, they had these various, you know, back and forth encounters and then the, the craft flew off and um, it became a very famous case. There's a new documentary coming out about it by one of the experiencers I know, Randy Nickerson, called the Ariel Phenomenon, because it was the Ariel School. And it tells this whole story. And John Mack, you know, rushed to um, Zimbabwe and interviewed these children on tape, and the tapes are available, and um, interviewed them. And he was very good with children, and he got their stories. And they drew pictures later of uh, what the craft looked like, what the, these little beings looked like. And they all told the same story. So, you know, again, no adults witnessed this. For some reason, adults were all tied up during recess. And uh, that's another weird thing. How did the aliens know if they did, you know, that this was a time to uh, land at the school when no adults would be around? So a lot of strange things. But that, that also is a very famous case. And there are many, many other cases that uh, are, are equally bizarre. Um, and one case is crazier than the next. <laughs> uh, do abductees tend to be fearful of their experience? Um, what happens to them after an alien encounter and their lives following those events? Yes, many of them are traumatized. Um, they, as John Mack found, they, they were not they didn't uh, ha have the experience as a result of trauma. This was a very important point he tried to make. In other words, um, it wasn't that they were sexual abuse victims and then they would fantasize that they'd been abducted. But after their experience, their abduction experience, uh, they then were traumatized. Uh, they were very fearful because it was obviously extremely frightening, the loss of control. Um, and, you know, people said again and again, this wasn't a dream. I know what a dream is. And by the way, John Mack wrote a book on nightmares. Uh, so he knew what nightmares were. I mean, he was an expert. Not only was he a, a Harvard psychiatrist with years of experience, you know, uh, treating and studying uh, aberrant states, but he'd actually made a special study of nightmares. So he knew the difference when these people said, this was not a nightmare. I was wide awake. I was as wide awake as I am now talking to you, um, but I had this experience. So, um, uh, so that was ex extremely traumatic. As a matter of fact, people said to John Mack, "Gee, I, I was hoping you'd tell me I was I was going crazy, because that's easier to deal with than telling me that this really happened on some level in some dimension." because that was the really scary thing. So many of them, most of them probably were traumatized in some way. Um, but John Mack found something else that was really unique to him. Unlike other uh, researchers of this phenomenon, uh, his, his people uh, tended to um, uh, take away um, concerns from the, the beings they encountered, concerns about the fate of the earth and the planet, lessons in the environmental destruction that humans are causing, 
uh, to the planet. And um, there was a kind of lesson embedded there to take better care of the planet, be better stewards of the earth. Um, and that, uh, and, and also, this is kind of sounds kind of strange, but the experience that these people had of encountering the aliens was in some way elevating to them. So along with the trauma, uh, which really freaked them out, scared them to death, um, they also felt a kind of kinship to these beings. They said that again and again, that they were connecting with a son sort of a, a spiritual source, a kind of God or deity or, or some benign force in the universe. So it wasn't only terror that they experienced the way they, they told John Mack. Now, other researchers like Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, who was another member of their small circle, professor at, at Temple University, didn't get this. Uh, the, uh, Jacobs and Hopkins uh, were pretty adamant that, the, that all these people suffered was terror and that they didn't understand how John Mack came away with this uh, kind of uh, happy uh, you know, lesson about taking better care of the earth. But anyway, that's the, that's the facts of the matter. Mack uh, you know, got this from his, his people. And uh, so, yes, they were deeply traumatized and terrified that this would happen again and terrified because it, it, it seemed to run in families, by the way. Um, it, it really seemed to strike people in their reproductive years, mostly, not old people, but yes, young people, uh, but mainly in their reproductive years and, and families, parents and children and grandchildren, um, as if uh, these aliens were tracking uh, lines of, of, of families. Um, again, makes no sense, but that, that's the story. Um, have sightings and abductions risen over the years or lessened, or has it stayed about the same throughout the years? Um, good question. It's very hard to say. Um, there are a few groups that track this. Uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, is one. Um, if you have a sighting, let's say, and you call MUFON, they, they might send an investigator to interview you and make a record of it. Um, but a lot of people don't uh, report these. But there are two researchers, um, including a woman I wrote up in the Times, Cheryl Costa, a very interesting uh, woman in her own right, a uh, transgender person who um, has actually become a key statistician of, of the UFO phenomenon and has now come out with two books sort of analyzing uh, just the, the data, uh, not the anecdotal experiences of people, but just what time of day these things were seen, where they were seen, what shapes, um, and uh, crunch the data. Um, and what I'm left with is that there's no particular trend, that it's not like they've stopped. And it's not like they've suddenly increased. Uh, they're going on all the time and all over the world. People say, well, why is this only happening in America? It's not only happening in America. It's happening all over the world. Now, America might be better disposed to record these things because out in the jungles, they're not people going around with laptops, you know, making a record or cell phones. But um, from what we know, uh, this is not a uh, geographically confined phenomenon. It's happening all over. It, ha it has been happening for a long time, maybe since the, the dawn of creation. Um, it's not clear you know, when this started. It, it certainly became famous, thanks to Roswell, thanks to you in New Mexico in 1947. But um, it may have you know, started a long time before that. What are some of the hard science discovered about aliens, uh, alien encounters and UFOs? Um, and what did John Mack contribute to science or um, the science of the mind psychology? Uh, also a good question. Well, first of all, let's separate UFOs and, and aliens for the moment because if UFOs have given rise to scientific uh, detection. Uh, thanks to the Pentagon, this is one of those things we wrote up in the New York Times, um, uh, pilots and ra Navy ships and radar have gotten electronic confirmation that these objects, whatever they are, uh, exist. And they were detected off the West Coast, off the East Coast. Um, they were seen by veteran pilots like, Dan, like Dave Fravor, who we wrote up in the New York Times, witnessed 
They looked like giant Tic Tacs, some of them, big white objects with no visible wings or tail or no visible means of propulsion, but a very graphic description like the, the Tic Tac candies. But they've also been detected on, on radar and other uh, thermal imaging devices. So, um, so that, that is one measurement of UFOs, that objects, again, we don't know where they come from, who's sending them, are they intelligent? None of those questions have been answered, but at least these things exist. That's a big step forward um, compared to years past when they were dismissed as hallucinations or a marsh gas or fly specks on the, you know, the windshield or you know, um, mental aberrations. Um, so that's one thing. Now, um, uh, what other scientific, uh, John Mack assembled uh, kind of a checklist of things that, that he thought argued for the reality, of some kind of reality of these things. Um, as I said, they, they were often spotted in aliens or, or spaceships. Um, aliens were often spotted in proximity to UFOs when they were sighted. Um, the stories have a basic consistency, hundreds, if not thousands of people in every country told very similar stories, and yet they were different enough so it was not the same story that people were passing on to each other, you know, word for word. Um, they were not getting it from, from TV or movies because some of the details are so wild that they've never been uh, in any movie or book. Um, Sometimes in one case, two girls who had a sleepover um, uh, later told the story of how they witnessed the UFO uh, during the night and the mother came down during the night to check on the girls and they were missing. And she called the police and they searched everywhere, they were gone. And a few hours later, they turned up back in their beds and later they said, yeah, we saw a UFO outside the window. They, they couldn't account for their so-called missing time either. But that was a, uh, an unusual case of a mother who confirmed that these girls were missing when they should have been in their beds. So that's interesting. So that's the scientific, a kind of scientific confirmation. Um, there are people working on um, trying to find changes in the bodies of people who have uh, reported encounters. It's very cutting edge research, very, very much at the beginning, but there do seem to be some effects on the human body, uh, people who have uh, told these stories. Um, and um, uh, so John Mack kind of, he, uh, he argued for a science of, of witnessing that we should uh, give more scientific credence to the uh, stories of people who witness uh, these, uh, these encounters, who've had these encounters, just like religion puts stock in the accounts of people who witnessed, um, you know, spiritual um, occurrences, the, the sightings at Fatima, for example, um, of the Virgin Mary. Um, so he said that that should be a scientifically acceptable uh, way of gathering evidence. Now, not everybody agrees because it's so, um, it's so individual and so, you know, personal. Um, science says, show us, you know, hard data. And of course it doesn't exist. Aliens have not been caught on, on camera successfully. Uh, there are no photo, unlike UFOs, which have been caught on camera and film uh, to some extent, usually not clearly, but they've been caught. Um, aliens have not. So that's where that stands. We have a lot of questions in the Q and A, so I'm gonna start uh, going through those. Um, Leonard asked, was he, um, John Mack, trying to convince people that UFOs existed or just present facts? Oh, he was definitely an advocate. Uh, he was trying to convince people. I mean, he believed because he was very um, invested in this and he was a very charismatic guy, um, he, he definitely took it as his mission to convince people that something was going on. Um, and um, he wasn't just a scientist, you know, assembling dry data. Uh, he, 
he actually gave talks at Harvard before, as I point out in the book, even before he had fully investigated the subject. As soon as, basically, as soon as he heard about it and started checking into it, he was so excited that he started talking about it at Harvard. So Harvard knew right away, by the way, that it wasn't a big secret that he was giving lectures on this. And he talked to Harvard audiences and um, he gave seminars at Harvard on, on these experiences. He brought in experiencers to talk to, to students. Um, uh, so it was not a big secret, but he was definitely uh, proselytizing that there was something real going on. As I said later, he kind of shaded his uh, his his views that to um, cast some doubt on what reality this this was happening in, because it's not happening in everyday reality. We don't see it happening in front of us. We don't see people being abducted on the street in front of us. It, it happens only to certain people. Um, and why those people are picked and not other people is another very good question. Um, Cheryl writes, have you received any new information on what you are calling the mystery since your book has been published? Uh, I, I have not. I mean, uh, I and, and my colleague at the New York Times, Leslie Kane, who uh, along with Helene Cooper, uh, broke the first story with me in the New York Times about the Pentagon agency investigating UFOs. Uh, we're continuing, Leslie and I in particular, continuing to report, um, uh, trying to pull together other stories because um, there's a lot going on. I mean, there's a new uh, federal agency that was set up uh, under the auspices of uh, Senator Gillibrand of New York um, to take over the investigation of UFOs. It's still in its infancy. You know, a lot of it is secret. We don't know what they've come up with. Uh, there'll probably be more reporting on that. So um, there, there's a lot going on. One of the last stories we did for the New York Times, um, and it was it was very fragmentary, and a lot of people were, were hoping for more. I'm sorry to disappoint them, but it was on um, briefings of congressional committees. Uh, on um, uh, supposed or uh, possible uh, uh, retrievals of material from crashed objects, crashed UFOs. Um, a lot of that information is classified. Uh, we don't know how much of that is real, how much uh, material exists, if any, what the government has learned about it, but there's a lot of stories around. And we're trying to you know, zero in on those stories. We reported a little of it in the New York Times, but there's uh, a lot left to report, and that would be, uh, it would seem to be certainly a worthy uh, goal for the future. Um, let's see, Cecilia writes, wasn't there actual documentation on what aliens in Roswell looked like? Maybe photos or maybe drawings? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, Roswell, uh, has been so um, um, complicated by the different stories the government told, starting with the very beginning. Uh, if, as you, I'm sure all your uh, listeners and viewers know, um, after the, the, this thing was, after something happened, crashed at Roswell in the summer of 1947, the military um, at the uh, base, but it was an atomic base, by the way, uh, that had, had dropped the atomic bomb, one of the atomic bombs on, on, on uh, Japan. Um, so it was an atomic group. Uh, they, they put out a press release saying a, a flying disc has been recovered at Roswell, crashed. And then they changed the story and said, oh no, it was a weather balloon. Well, um, um, the people who are involved in that recovery uh, over the years, have said, no, no, it was clearly not a weather balloon. These were pieces we turned over to the government. We don't have them anymore. But anyway, so many different stories came out. Um, and it was, uh, and, the, and the government didn't help by saying later that um, UFOs didn't exist, uh, that these were all hallucinations. Um, the government did not do itself a, a service by denying what everybody who had seen one of these things knew including veteran pilots of World War II. They knew what they had seen, including a, a famous astronomer, Clyde Tombaugh, who had discovered the planet Pluto. Not the planet now, it's been downgraded. But um, And so these people were, were, were smart 
people, veteran pilots and scientists, and they knew what they had seen. They couldn't explain what they'd seen, but they knew it wasn't the planet Venus. It wasn't marsh gas. It wasn't, the, it wasn't reflections from the desert floor. It was some real thing that scared them to death. And then the government comes out and said, no, no, we've investigated and all these things are, are, are uh, explainable. Well, they're not all explainable. And Project, Project Blue Book, which was the, the military's last big effort before this to investigate the phenomenon um, before it shut down at the end of 1969, uh, agreed uh, that there was 700 unexplained cases. I mean, some cases that were explained. I mean, clearly there were aircraft in later years, satellites, reflections, a lot of things. Um, not every uh, weird light in the sky was a UFO, but after they you know, uh, eliminated all the things that it could have been, weather balloons and atmospheric effects and et cetera, they were left with 701 cases they just could not explain. Um, but they glossed over that later and said, oh, no, it's just, you know, it's a lot of nonsense because they, again, why? They didn't want people going around worried. Uh, they, want, they, they didn't want people to think the government didn't know, which it didn't, what these things were. So, um, so that's, you know, that, that's where, that's where we're, we're at now. I mean, uh, uh, the, the government uh, got in its own way for many years. This is an interesting question uh, from Anonymous. Um, in your research, have you found any experiencers who have proactively initiated communication or contact with alien beings, either on their own volition or such as using Dr. Stephen Greer's protocol? Um, if so, did the experiencers receive a response? Yes, uh, there are stories. I haven't uh, spent time um, uh, much time. I, I've interviewed a lot of experiences, including people who John Mack worked with, uh, but people who have come out who've had experiences since John Mack died. Um, and uh, some of them have told me um, that they feel they can feel when these um, UFOs with with intelligent uh, life uh, are are approaching. And some can even call them in or say, you know, when, I mean, Betty Hill, um, who outlived her husband, Barney, and from the first big, you know, UFO uh, uh, alien encounter in the 60s, um, uh, claimed later that she was in regular communication. And uh, that was greeted with a lot of disbelief and skepticism, because in the, in the end, none of these claims can be put to rest. I mean, that, that's the problem. They are still a giant mystery. But there are people who say that uh, they at least know when these things are going to appear. They get a sense. I've talked to many experiences who say that. They sort of know they get a, a feeling in their body when these things are going to appear. One, one experiencer told me that um, um, he could see uh, at night a panel opening on the a wall, a kind of a light rectangle, a panel opening, and reptilian creatures, uh, you know, emerging from that panel. And he kind of knew when it was it was coming. Um, so uh, to answer your question, yes, there, there are stories of people who say they're not just um, helpless, you know, um, bystanders who, uh, you know, uh, uh, are, are accosted. And by the way, abduction is not a very good term for this whole experience because um, that suggests a kind of physical kidnapping, whereas in many cases, it's more of an encounter, um, uh, much more subtle than that. But anyway, uh, but there are people, to answer your question, the, the viewer's question, that who, who say they have found ways of, of calling in. And Stephen Greer is somebody who takes people into the desert and, um, and, and they, they believe, they tell stories that they are able to call in these, these craft. Um, what, what are some of the changes found in the bodies um, that you've seen or have been seen of abductees? Um, 
Um, okay, so um, again, uh, th this is very early science. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in this. There are people who are studying this, but um, um, they do uh, seem to, to, to see some uh, uh, measurable uh, effects on, on cell structure, uh, different parts of the brain. Um, it's very vague, um, and uh, but you know it does. There does seem to be some kind of a nexus with this Havana syndrome. By the way, this very mysterious condition that U.S. diplomats have reported uh, from Havana, from China, from other places where they um, they say they were targeted by some kind of sonic weapon that d d disabled them, and the government has been studying this uh, for, for for a number of years. And uh, they, don't, they don't know what it is. I mean, is it an, a Russian or Chinese weapon that is being trained on, on um, American diplomats and service people? Seems to focus on them, not ordinary civilians. Um, uh, at different places, people in you know, different intersections in, in Havana and in China and Russia. Um, but um, it's very complicated and no clear answer has emerged, but the latest research I've looked at seems to show some kind of similarity between the, the effects that they found on some of these people of sufferers of Havana syndrome and the, the effects have been clear. I mean, they, they claim that they are ringing in the ears, that they are disoriented, they, are, they feel <coughs> nauseous, um, so it's a very real condition that they suffer. Um, um, and that seems to mimic some of the things that some people who have been exposed to UFOs seem to have suffered burns, um, some kind of actual burns on the skin. Um, and one um, witness has actually collected money from the federal government claiming that he was uh, in his military, US military service was subject to um, uh, injury from exposure to a, a UFO in England um, uh, as a result of his service. And he actually got uh, some kind of settlement in one of the few cases. So th that's the kind of effects that are being studied. Thank you. Um, this is a fun question. Have you seen the movie Fire in the Sky? If so, what do you think of the story depicted there? Uh, Travis, Walton. Yeah, Travis, Travis Walton. Yeah, Travis Walton story. Uh, I, I have not actually. I have actually. I have the video here at home. I have not seen it, but I know a little bit about the story, and it was interesting because it sparked some controversy recently. Uh, this was a story about a guy who was in the woods with friends years ago, and um, uh, and they saw a UFO, and and he disappeared. And he came back later, he reappeared and said that he'd been abducted. And um, the very strange story that uh, was not, um, nobody could poke holes in it uh, at the time. I mean, um, uh, he, he was a, 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 a credible witness um, and it became one of the great mysteries of, of you know, abduction. Now, in recent years, very recently, in recent months, uh, people have come forward to say that th they debunked his story and they claim to have found some holes in his story. Um, and then he came back and, and debunked the debunkers. Um, so it was kind of left hanging and there was no clear outcome of it. But uh, there was a movie, as exactly as, as was said, Fire in the Sky, telling that story. And there have been a number of these uh, stories. There was a Betty and Barney Hill story um, was uh, in, in the movies, um, Interrupted Journey. And um, in, in some ways, it's counterproductive, you know, that these things have been told in fictional movies because it uh, it erodes the line between fact and fiction. And people think that they know these stories or they think that they're fictional because they, they saw them in the movies. And, um, you know, movies are going to do what they're going to do. They're not taking, you know, they're not going to say, well, we're, we're going to avoid this subject because it muddies the waters. But um, it doesn't always help um, to, uh, you know, to have fictional treatments of these real stories because John Mack was very, very, 
adamant in his research to say, um, this is what these people told me. This is what I checked out. And by the way, I guess I should tell you that he was hoaxed himself, John Mack. Um, I tell the story in the book that a woman came forward and said she'd been abducted and he was treating her or, or counseling her. And then she turned on him and gave a long statement to Time Magazine saying that she hoaxed him with a fake story and he believed it. And Time Magazine jumped on it and really uh, put John Mack through the ringer. Uh, it was a terrible embarrassment to, to him and to Harvard. And he, he found actually, and I tell the story in the book, it, it appears later that the woman who came out with the story actually was an experiencer because she told stories to other people earlier um, that really had the ring of truth about things that she had encountered with her family. But nevertheless, um, uh, it, it was an interesting um, uh, incident, a case, because it showed how John Mack could be gullible at times and was not sufficiently cautious at times because he threw himself into this field with such um, enthusiasm. I think that's the biggest um, criticism you can make of him is that he was a little over enthusiastic and could have been more careful and more studied. Um, I mean, he tried to get peer review of his, his research, couldn't get it. Um, so it was not only his doing, but uh, he, he was that kind of a feck, a little bit of fecklessness uh, crept in and that, uh, and then that hurt him. Um, I'll just read a few more questions. I don't okay. want to be too much longer um, before you wrap up, <clears throat> but here's another interesting question from James and Sherry. Given that encounters may occur in alternate reality, did John Mack consider that they may actually be ghosts or discarnate beings? Is there a way to distinguish? Former fairy folk may cloak themselves as aliens in current popular mind? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, in the beginning, John Mack took these stories very literally. Um, when people told him they'd been abducted by aliens, he, he believed that they were some kind of creatures from space who'd come to Earth to abduct you know, humans, to experiment on them, whatever. Um, later on, as I said in, in um, his second book and in subsequent lectures, he became much more careful and realized that th this may be happening in some other reality. And he expanded his view of um, the, the mysteries of the universe. Um, and um, he didn't say, as I remember, that these could be ghosts or these could be spirits or whatever, but he, he was much more open to um, the uh, other questions that, that were um, equally pressing um, uh, other than uh, abduction, for example, crop circles. Where do crop circles come from? Some of them are man-made, they're hoaxes, but others seem to appear at night in the fields, particularly of England, of you know, strange uh, symmetrical patterns that defy uh, explanation. Um, um, he was very interested in the, the grail legend, the, whole, the legend of the Holy Grail, that there was more to it than that that um, there was something mysterious in the, um, the stories of, of Christianity. And particularly at the end of his life, he was interested in uh, the whole question of life after death. Um, and he was actually working on another book um, about a young woman, a very talented woman um, who, who died young, a psychiatrist named Elizabeth Targ, who um, was studying uh, brain tumors and then uh, actually uh, suffered a, the same kind of brain tumor she was studying and died. And um, according to the research that John Mack did with Elizabeth's um, husband and family, uh, they reported manifestations of her uh, after she died um, coming back. And he got very interested in the whole question of does consciousness survive death? Um, 
And um, it's a very interesting topic because people have reported near-death experiences when they were dead, supposedly flatlined on a hospital table. And afterwards they remember who was in the room and what, what the doctors were saying about them. And I mean, it, it, this is in the data. Uh, it's, it's not explainable. There are cases of uh, apparent reincarnation of uh, kids who uh, remember a previous life. So John was um, aware that there were all these other questions uh, that were equal, equally mysterious um, that deserved study. And it may not just be one thing, um, that it may be part of a whole set of mysteries of another reality or, or some kind of dimension that we don't understand. And certainly physics is coming up with new understandings all the time. Of, of black holes and, and the mysteries of physics and how we might be able to travel faster than the speed of light after all. Maybe ideas travel faster than the speed of light. Maybe uh, the universe itself is expanding at a rate that might, uh, is constantly expanding into what? So um, anyway, uh, he to answer your question, he did become aware of a lot of other mysteries, uh, whether these you know ghosts um, uh, spirits. Uh, it was just uh, one miss. It was like Chinese nesting doll, like Russian nesting dolls. One one mystery inside another. Here's another mystery. Um, many witnesses in the past have claimed being approached by one or two men after um, they reported encounters supposedly pressuring them to not speak of their experience. Did you come across any of these conjectures in your research? Yes, that's a so-called men in black, <laughs> another mystery. I mean, amazing stories of people who, um, one, uh, I believe it was Whitley Strieber, I'm not sure, another very well-known uh, writer on abduction phenomenon. Um, but uh, somebody recalled the story of going into a bookstore and seeing two, strange creatures um, in, dressed in black uh, laughing over a book over his book. Um, they were looking through the book and, and pointing to different passages and laughing. Um, people and I tell some of these stories in my book, the people who've had visits um, from uh, the so called men in black strange uh, people who um, who dress in dark colors, uh, drive dark cars, um, seem to communicate telepathically that they, they uh, radiate fear and they, um, uh, you know, uh, they have the effect of, of, of frightening people who've had these encounters. Um, you know, some people thought, well, maybe they're government agents uh, who are trying to, you know, preserve secrecy of, of this field, but the stories don't uh, clearly point to the fact that these people are human, are government agents. So yes, it's, it's a well-known phenomenon. And again, the movie muddied the waters, Men in Black and Men in Black 2, and they made kind of fun of it, but it is a real phenomenon that, uh, that people have talked about. Thank you so much. Um, this has been an amazing visit with you, Ralph Blumenthal. Um, I can't thank you enough for doing this program with our Santa Fe community and those joining us far and wide. Um, thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. You can check out um, Ralph Blumenthal's The Believer from our shelves here at Santa Fe Public Library. Um, it's available on many online vendors. You can also request it from your local bookstores. Um, be sure to check it out, read The Believer. Um, I'm sure it'll answer a lot more of your questions and leave you with more questions about the world and the universe and uh, UFOs and aliens. Um, a million times, thank you, Ralph. Uh, thank you. It's also available, by the way, in audiobooks and Kindle. So uh, people can get it instantly on their devices or for people, I've had people tell me they have trouble uh, reading, uh, bad eyesight or so, you can get it uh, audio. Anyway, thank you. A real pleasure. Very good questions. And uh, as I said, I, I love <laughs> Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful state and I can't wait to get back. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening.